Welcome everybody to the Maryland Opera Recitative Series. This is a series of conversations with people who are near and dear to the Maryland Opera. And I'm really happy to present today the fabulous Erica Marie Ferguson. I've known Erica for maybe almost 10 years or so as an opera camper. And we've also collaborated on many other projects. And she just, she's the future of opera and a wonderful, vibrant, engaged and fierce young artist. Welcome, Erica. How are you? Good. It's so good to be here. Oh my goodness. What a, what a kind introduction. <laughs> I mean every word of it. I truly do. So let's get right into the nitty gritty. Um, when did you first know that you wanted to be a singer? And when was it that opera specifically called you as where you wanted to go? Well, I honestly cannot think of a time in my life where I did not want to be a singer. It's always been my dream, my goal, and something that I love, but I didn't know what type of singer I wanted to be. And for many years, I tried different styles. I tried folk, country, pop, everything. But I was in a performing arts middle school, and we were doing um, Dies Irae from Mozart's Requiem, and it just felt so natural to sing that type of music. And so people started saying to me, you sound like an opera singer. I mean, I'm 12 years old, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I went to my voice teacher at the time and said, could I try this? And she gave me the 24 Italian songs and arias book and I fell in love. And I've been studying classical voice ever since. And your family was very supportive of you, right? Yes, they have always supported me in anything that I wanted to do. But um, specifically my mother, once she knew that I wanted to be a singer, she would, she put me into voice lessons. She bought me a guitar when I thought I wanted to be a country singer. She has always been very supportive all the way through. You know, uh, Miss Ferguson, we were so delighted to have you in our opera camp. And I believe you came to that when you were still in high school. Can you let me know how um, our ex your experience with opera camp brought you to where you are today as an artist and a singer? Yes, so I came to the opera camp at a very pivotal moment in my development as a singer. I was honestly not in a very happy place. Um, and I had just done my very first opera. I was playing Barbarina in Le Nozze di Figaro, and the woman playing the Countess said that she saw a post online saying that you needed more campers, and she said, you have to work with this man. You have to meet James Harp. And so, I mean, the rest is really history. Being a part of that opera camp solidified to me that this is what I want to do. I remember standing on stage at the Lyric and looking out into the audience and just seeing this beautiful theater and thinking to myself, I want to perform in theaters like this for the rest of my life. It is very inspiring, isn't it? It really is. And it's such an amazing opportunity to have young people entrusting them to go on stage and sing. I mean, to me, experience is the best teacher. And so I really appreciated that opportunity. It was wonderful to have you. So speaking of The Marriage of Figaro, you and I have quite a relationship with that opera. Uh, one of the highlights of my career was uh, two years ago when we produced La Nosa di Figaro at Towson in a particular concept that was kind of like the 60s Mad Men. And the uh, Countess, you, it was really kind of extraordinary about how we brought a, a contemporary feel to her, but also a very timeless feel as well of someone who is in love with somebody and it's not quite working out. And I'll particularly re remember the little moment at the end where I kind of had you die a little. And remember that moment where the lights came on you? And it was so beautiful. Can you let me know, um, how did you feel about a concept piece like that? Which wasn't the way that Mozart wrote it, but we took it with great devotion. And I think we actually did bring a little more illumination to his already perfect story. Yes, 
I mean, I believe that taking these classic stories and doing something different with it, doing something unique, is the future of opera. It's bringing classic stories to people in a way that maybe will be more relatable. And I kept thinking about, um, in act two, the scene, um, the trio between the Countess, the Count, and Susanna, there were bits of domestic abuse that were brought out of the score. And I thought that that was so, it was just such a amazing addition to the story because I kept thinking there has to be someone in the audience that needs to see this. Oh, you had better believe it. You know, we very had to carefully choreograph because he was kind of manhandling you. Yeah. And he even had those instruments where he was going to open the door. It was a little terrifying. And while that can be triggering, it also can be cathartic as well. So what other productions have you been doing since then? Because you, you've been at Maryland Opera Studio where they do such marvelous work. Yeah, so this fall we did Ario Dante by Handel and I was able to play the Princess Ginevra, which was a very, very fun experience. Um, it's my first Handel role. So learning how to do all of that coloratura and um, sustaining long lines were the big challenge of that piece. <laughs> and um, last summer I performed Princess Ida with Victorian Lyric Opera. And so I see there's a trend in my career so far of playing princesses, but I don't mind it at all. <laughs> um, and then yes. also at University of Maryland, we do a new work reading of a brand new opera that is composed specifically for our singers. And I was very honored to play the title role in that um, this past year. We did Hajar by Elizabeth Neal Green, and it was a um, modernization of the biblical story of Hagar. And it was, it was an honor to perform that music. So it's wonderful to know that you have so much going on, Miss Ferguson. And as I've told you before, I always admire that you are a very ambitious young artist. And in this day and age, you have to be ambitious. And um, I, I applaud that, and I think it's going to take you as even greater places. I first kind of witnessed this when you were in opera camp, and I wanted to let you know about this little story. We were doing a performance in the Baltimore City Hall for Stephanie Rawlings Blake, the ma mayor of the time. And the opera campers had come there, we were doing excerpts for her. We had the piano there, and you were going to sing Omio Mio Babino Caro. And when it was your time to sing, I got confused with the order and I announced another piece. Well, you popped up right beside me and said, now is the time for my solo. And I loved it, Miss Ferguson, because you were ready to sing. You had planned when you wanted to go on and you were ready to sing. And I have always been so, I was impressed by that because you were prepared, you were invested in it. And I said, this young lady is going to go far. So God bless you with all of that. Um, I did want to mention one thing about, you're, you're such a, a, a human artist that shows that you're invested in everything. I remember two years ago when after the Figaro production, um, your father, your beloved father, passed away very suddenly. And if I recall, it was the day before your senior recital. Was. And we all, because we all love you so much, we were all so concerned for you that you would be able to do this. Particularly, weren't you doing the Samuel Barber Knoxville, summer of 1915, that talks about my father? And you decided in order to honor your father who was so supportive of you, that you would go ahead and do it. And we were all with you every minute of the way, Miss Ferguson. Can you let me know how you were able to do that? Yes, so it was the hardest day of my entire life, obviously, absolutely horrific. And I, I was at school, I get a phone call saying that I have to go home but my senior recital is the next day. And so one of the first people I called was my voice teacher at the time, Terry Bickham. 
And I said, what do I do? And she said, we will go along with you no matter what you choose to do. If you want to postpone it, if you want to cancel, we will go along with you. And I said, I can't help but feel like I want to do this. And it was this this nagging inside of me knowing that my father would be so mad at me if I didn't. He was always the, the, the type of person to be so selfless and to know that he was the reason I wasn't going on, I know he would be so mad at me. And so with that thought in mind, I said, I have to do this. And I dedicated the piece to him, even though I wasn't able to say those words at the time. In hindsight, it was a dedication to him. And I sang that piece through tears and through a choking throat, but I had to do it. And there were many times that I thought I was going to break down, but I just had to keep telling my story in that moment. It felt like I was connected not only to my father, but also connected to Samuel Barber, who went through a very similar experience, and to um, James Agee, who wrote that short, short prose. And that's what's so special about music. I think it speaks when we don't have the words to say how we're feeling, and it connects people from all different generations. So... Yeah, that piece will always hold a very special place in my heart. And I have been able to sing it in the future, um, in, the, in recent years, and um, less tears, but still an open heart. It's a very special piece to me. Well, you know, it's interesting because I know in opera camp, when we speak about expressive music, I often will tell people, sing this as if this would be the last piece of music you would ever sing in your life and how that colors how you emotion. You know, um, we shouldn't be ashamed of being emotional, of being vulnerable, because we are interpreting all of life and there's joy and there's sorrow in life as well. Um, so thank you for agreeing to talk about that. I know that I was so deeply moved and I think other people will be moved as well, that we so connect with what we have to give that sorrow or tears don't obscure what we have to offer. So to end on a happier note, Ms. Ferguson, we're all expecting a great career from you. So what is your dream opera role? My dream opera role, the, the first and only name that pops into my head is Tosca. Oh, stop. <laughs> it's just... Because she's an opera singer herself, right? Yeah. And she also gets to sing the definitive moment in for, a, for a, an artist's life, Visidarte. Visidarte. And on top of that, I think that the relationships between her and the two male leads are so juicy. Every scene is so complex. And as a, as a performer, as a singing actor as well, I just am dying to sink my teeth into that role. And you know, it's always so amazing when you look at the score Puccini, every bar is telling you something. And every bar has at least two subtexts to it. It's just amazing. Well, I look forward to either being in the audience or on the podium or stage directing you on your debut as Tosca. Well, Ms. Ferguson, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And uh, I know that we'll keep watching your wonderful career. And everybody, thank you for joining us for our Maryland Opera Recitative Series conversations with those near and dear to us. Opera now and forever. See you later.